right. Come and work for us. I'm like, really? Take a second break. Take a drink. I just want to share this. Hang on. Hang on. Everybody who's now came on tonight's broadcast, we now have TrueHouseStories.com available with all the back shows. And as well, we need you all to sign up for the newsletter so that you know what's going on each and every week. As you see, we have tremendous, tremendous talent and listening to Mr. Grand Park tell it. Again, TrueHouseStories.com, share it, hit the newsletter, subscribe, be part of the fun. So now that Graham's back, we're going to go right back to Grand Park again. So, yeah, so, wait, so wait, 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 okay. wait, 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 let me paint the picture for everybody. Okay. okay. Imagine this is the super, one of the first super clubs. The v- first super club in the one UK. Of the first, v- no question about it. And he's christened the job. Oh, you, we want you to come and play. He's like, yeah. And then he does a fantastic job. You can imagine on the side of the DJ booth, the DJ scratching with their cat claws to want to get in that place. Correct? And he's going, uh, yeah. oh, okay. I'll just- I mean, it's worse now. It's worse now, but oh, even God. then. But, I mean, again, when Ministry of Sound opened in London in the early 90s, right, people were like, oh, why I really want to work there. And I, and I was like, well, I, I, I've got a gig. I've got a great gig. I get a phone call from like Justin Berkman. There he goes. Um, yep. Hey, Graham, what do you do on Fridays? I went, well, um, I, I, I've recently moved Saturdays at Hacienda. So nothing he goes, great. I want you to come and be the Friday night resident at this new club in London called Ministry of Sound. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, and then, and then when the Hacienda closed, Cream asked me to go and be a resident there and on to give, they gave me two james barton called you for the cream as well did he say yeah well he used to come to hacienda and say yeah. listen so what are you I, doing? I think you should <laughs> what are you doing now? Said, yeah yeah you know, he wanted me to, to to leave the hacienda and go to cream i said absolutely not that's never going to happen but of course when the hacienda closed he then said right i want to give you your own monthly friday night call it call it full on it's an all-nighter you and a guest and i remember the first one was me and roger sanchez and it was every month so I've always, always been very, very lucky. I think it's I think also as well. I think it stems from the fact that what I wanted to be was playing a rock and roll band. I never wanted to be a DJ. So I think that's kind of still at the back of my mind. Oh, am I still a DJ? Am I still doing this? Of course, ironically, you could argue with Hacienda Classical, which um, the last two years I, I actually sing a couple of songs. I've gone back to playing in a band, albeit on a much, much grander scale because on, we our fan club do we all know that graham sings do we have anybody has his songs let's get them youtubed up okay up on the links tell us what they I, are no, no, I, I'll, I'll tell you I, I i used to sing in a band right before i was a dj that we we did a show it was the first year of Hassi in the classical and um we did a rehearsal uh one afternoon and peter hook couldn't make the rehearsal and mike refused to come to the rehearsal because his football team, Man City, were playing Arsenal and he wanted to watch that in the hotel instead, right? And we were doing, it was only the third or fourth show, and, and when it came to Blue Monday, which we do in the show, um, because Hookie wasn't there to do his mic check, I said, oh, you know what? I've been playing Blue Monday for years. I love it. I just went down to the front of the stage at the dress rehearsal, grabbed the mic and sang uh, Blue Monday because I know it, right? And got a round of applause of everyone afterwards, right? Well, because of that, um, six months later, the last show of 2016, Hookie's flight uh, in, from Italy got delayed, so he didn't make the show. And there was, a, there was real panic because how do we do Blue Monday without Peter Hook? And the, the, all the male singers in the choir were like, well, we can't do it. We're, we're gospel singers. How can we sing Blue Monday? We're gospel singers. It's not something we can do. And the conductor... And the girl who runs the choir just said, Graham, you do it. Remember when you did, did it at the rehearsal? I said, no, that's different. A rehearsal's different. This is like 6,000 people. And with this is a proper show. And they said, well, who else is going to do it? And I went, oh, 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 gosh, okay. But secretly inside, right, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to get to sing Blue Monday <laughs> with a 70-piece orchestra. Wow. So, 
so I did it. But Mike, Mike was like, oh, I'm not sure it's a good idea. So I, but I did it anyway. When the drums came in, and I just took my headphones off and walked down to the stage and picked up the mic. How you doing, everyone? And everyone's like, whoa. And then it goes. Right. And everyone's going crazy. And then I just go, how does it feel? And the place were like, what is that part? <laughs> anyway. Grandpa so, singing? So huh? what happened then, the stage manager was videoing it without telling me. Of course. And as course. and as soon as we, as soon as we finished the song and I went back behind the decks and the keyboards and samplers and everything, he sent it to Peter Hook in Italy. And Hookie saw this and thought, this is amazing. So when the tour finished and we're talking about what to do in next year's show, he said, listen, I'm glad you did Blue Monday. I thought it was fantastic. Don't tell anyone, but I can't do about half of next year's show. I want you to sing Blue Monday. At which point I said, Hookie, what makes you think Blue Monday is going to be in the show? Right. As a joke. And he went, oh, no, of course. If you if it's not going to be in the show, so of course it's going to be in the show, and you're going to do it half the time, and I'm going to do it the other half the time. Right. So I did in the second year. I found myself singing Blue Monday at the Royal Albert Hall and at these great festivals and, and, and live venues, and then that went so well that in the third year of the show, the the um, hooky and the conductor and arranger and some of the sing some of the girl singers said, "You should have your own song." You should have your own song. So in the third year of the show, I, I, I would do Blue Monday if Hookie couldn't do the show, but I, we did a, a, a version of Rock the Casbah. The Clash is Rock the Casbah. I love Rock the so Casbah. I, so I, so exactly, so I got to... All night, baby. Do, yeah, do, do, yeah. Do, do. So I got to do that with a... The rock the Casbah. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the girls all going, Rock the Casbah. Rocking the Casbah, and I'm about the king told the boogeyman, you got to let that ragger drop. And so I got to that. And then the last year show, you know, my remix of Brand New Heavy's Back to Love. Yes. Well, that is in my key. And and the, the male vocal on that is the drummer or the former drummer. So uh, I put that in the show, and everyone said, Well, Graham, you should sing this. So <laughs> yeah, the last two years. So the last two years of the show, uh, not only do I play keyboards and fire and samples and, and do lots of scratching and live stuff, I get to go down the front with a microphone and sing. So I've gone back. I'm actually doing what I wanted to do when I was at school. It's Children the most bizarre thing. Of disco. Remember yeah. this. Mm. Careful what you wish for. He left the band to go to the record shop to yep. go the whole career, trap yeah. the world, to come back to sing to all of you. But you know, but you I know do. what I think. You know what I think it is, right? And I, and I tell this to up and coming DJs and musicians of talent: don't take yourself too seriously, right? It's about, to me anyway, it's about enjoying it. Now, okay, I've made a career out of it. I've made a lot of money out of it. I've lost a lot of money out of it as well. Um, but we'll get to never, really, we'll get to. I know, but I've never really taken myself too seriously, right? And some people do. I get people saying, like, I'm so focused. I'm so and fine. Be focused. Do your best job, right? But, but, you know, I just don't take myself seriously. And I still, when I'm at the Royal Albert Hall, walking down the front going, how are you all doing out there? Make London make some noise. There's a voice in my head going, can you believe that you're doing this? And this other voice goes, no, I can't believe I'm doing it. And then I just do it. I think the minute I start taking myself too seriously, I'll think I, I would struggle. I, re I, I really would. <laughs> oh, my God. But you know what? That's where life is. You know, you jump into things. It is, though. You jump into things. Otherwise, either, uh, otherwise, you're like the others on the outside. I always use this example. It's like at the front of Harrods and the glass displays. Then you're looking mm. in. At the score, if to yep. be able to jump in and say, I don't care, even if I fail, it's all worth it, we'll do it, you know, not be afraid to fail exactly. But it's up to me, it's always been about the enjoyment, right? And then, so if you get paid for it and you know, you got money in the bank, great. But I, I, I got to travel the world, right? I'd never left the UK 
until I became a DJ. And I, I mentioned Mark Caymans, the late Mark Caymans earlier, because he, he, he produced like Quando Quango. And he, he was friends with Mike Pickering. He came at the Hacienda and he was always, he always had a whistle and he loved the Hacienda, right? And he'd cut, he'd, he used to love to really drink as well, if you, if you remember. And he'd come in the DJ booth and he'd go, hey, Graham, hey, Graham. Get some fucking sirens on, man. Some fucking sirens. And and I'd go, yeah, yeah, what a great idea. And and he just put a siren on. And he was always right. And so whatever you were playing, you drop a siren and the place would erupt. Anyway, one night back at Mike's, Mark came and goes, Hey Graham, I want you to come and DJ at the Mars Club in, in New York. And I'm like, oh, really? I'm like, very no. Well, West Side Highway, yes. Yeah. I'm like, you're kidding me. No, seriously, you gotta come. You'd be great. You'd be fantastic. I'm like, yeah, but I've never flown. I've never, I haven't even got a passport. I've never left the country. Anyway, Mike Pickering Everybody goes. Just get your stuff and get your ass on the plane. Too. Yeah. So right? Mike, Mike's like, listen, you're going. He's going. Because he, Mike, Mike had been in New York. I'd never been in New York, right? And, of course, all the music that I was playing, a lot of it was from New York. And all the music I loved, Talking Heads and, like, Blondie. Did, oh, I, Mike, and Africa Bambara. Did Pickering ever mention to you that they perform at the garage? Paradise garage? Yes, he did. Yeah, How he did. He did. big was to their whole thing? That was he, Exactly. Thing. Listen, you need to get Mike on this. He's got he amazing work, stories. He doesn't answer my calls either. He's another one. Right, I'll leave it with me because he would be fantastic. He's got some amazing Everybody, stories. Everybody, you want to hear Mike Pickering's story from M People? I've been asking for years. Let's get him on. Listen, <laughs> no, dude, I'll, I'll have it because I, I, I learned my early, very early days of my career. I learned a lot from Mike because he'd been around the block a few times more than me, right? And I learned a lot from him. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, so I get the passport, get the visa, and everything. And um, Mike, uh, it was, it was uh, Mike took me to Manchester Airport. I'd never flown, right? And I remember, like, he says, right, okay, have a great you time. I'm like, what? Where ever before? I'd that? Never flown ever. No, no, <laughs> never. Trip to America. Oh, my God. Yeah, my first ever trip, right? And it was February 89. It was freezing, right? And anyway, I get at the airport. Mike goes, okay, have a great trip. See you. I'm like, what do you mean have a great trip? See you. Aren't you coming to the – because I can't come to the plane. You have to go through now, and you're on your own. And I, I was like – I was 23, 24, so nervous. Anyway, I get on the plane. I'd never been – it was a jumbo jet, 747. I had a window seat. I'm like, oh, my God, this is freaking me out. I can't believe it. I'm on a plane. I looked out the window and I was like, said to the woman next to me, oh my God, look at that. The people look like ants. The people on the ground look like ants. And she said, calm down. They are ants. We haven't taken off yet. Right? <laughs> That's a terrible You're freaking out. <laughs> yeah. Everything's going yeah. wrong. And you're like, but anyway, no, but I, I, again, no, I vividly remember. <laughs> never like, right? So listen, but anyway, I, I vividly remember that we start taxiing to the wrong way. And then when we took off, I remember this vividly. I'm like going, yes, this is amazing. I couldn't believe it. I was flying to New York. I was 23, 24. I had a, a, ba a box of records in the hold, right? And a bag of enough clothes for a week. And I landed at JFK. And um, Mark Caymans was there to meet me. And um, got on a yellow New York taxi. I'm like, fucking what? And of course, I'm like, uh, do we do we go over the Brooklyn Bridge? He went, no, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna go tunnel, man. I'm like, but Mark, I've never been in New York. And he's like, oh man, you want to go over a bridge? Okay, we'll go over a fucking bridge. You know what I mean, like that. And we get to New York. We dump we dump our stuff at his apartment, which is a loft apartment. And I'm like, this is like being in a film. I'm I'm looking at the. The, the twin towers when they were there. I'm looking at the Empire State as we as we're going into Manhattan, and I'm thinking, I can't believe this. We get we dump his stuff. He lives in a loft apartment with one of those elevators with the big doors that open up like like that, you know. And we dump the stuff, and I look out the window, and I'm like, oh my god, Mark, that that fire station across the street looks like the fire station from from Ghostbusters. He goes. It is the fucking, it is the fucking fire station from Ghostbusters. I'm like, you live opposite the fire station from Ghostbusters. You know what I mean? No way. No. Is it, I, I gotta, yeah, yeah, I yes. I live by over that, by, where the Ghostbusters movie was. Yeah. So then we go out record shopping, record shopping in New York. And Mark knows everyone. He knows all the people in the store. He, he knows everybody. the DJs. He knew everyone. And 
I had a list. I want to do. I want to do Staten Island Ferry. I want to do Empire State. I want to do Statue of Liberty. I want to go. I don't want to do none of that shit. You say right? no. I didn't. I didn't do any of that. I didn't. Any of it, right? I didn't see daylight for a week. Right? I was crawling into bed as the sun was coming up. Right? Right. And Mark. Mark was waking me up at four in the afternoon yeah. going, we got to go to this record store because it's the day they get all the great shit in and all that stuff. And then I, I went to a couple of clubs with him. And then suddenly it was my, my, my night at Mars, right? The old meatpacking district, which now is very kind of swanky, right? But then it was still a meatpacking district. Hey, and hey, wait, hang on. Around that area, we had transvestites. And it, it. was in the, also at three o'clock in the morning, they had meat companies that would have exactly. coming in cutting everything up so you can imagine exactly. now you see it on those shows like sex in the city they, they're living yeah. in the area it's very swanky but when he exactly. came, it was no ugly exactly beef yeah it did smell the beef and it was brilliant and i again i'm like i can't believe i'm doing this so i get to the to the Mars Club and there's like three or four turntables and there's a rotary mixer which I've never seen before and a great DJ booth and amazing monitors. I thought, oh my god, this is amazing. Why isn't the hacienda like this? You know, it's it's incredible. The the difference in quality of sound system and the, the way the DJ booth was built was a different world. I couldn't believe it. And I'm like, this is amazing. And then uh, people had said to me, Oh yeah, you you British guys. You British guys, you can't mix records. I went, oh, hang on a minute. Whoa, whoa. Yes, you've got a point, but you've not heard me. I started to get a little bit a little bit cocky because I was getting carried away with the moment. And anyway, I went on the decks. And, of course, I, I could mix. I, 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 I'll happily say that British DJs used to be rubbish at mixing on vinyl. Technology has changed that. But I used to listen to Tony Humphrey's mixtape. That's right, because you threw it on all the Americans. So you knew it yeah, was yeah. I listen to Humphreys mixtapes. I listen to Marley Marl mixtapes, right? Well, so I, and I did. The afternoon yeah, BLS did and learned how to do all that. So I was like, yeah, come on then, you lot. And I just showed off and mixed. But then, let's get this as a true story. True, true story. Because it's true house stories. I'm not going to lie. I'm like, Mark, Mark, Mark. And Mark's drinking and getting on in. We're having a great time. He's in the DJ booth. And he's saying, yeah, this is my, this is my man, Graham. From, from from Manchester and all this stuff, right? I'm loving it, really, absolutely loving it. And I go, hey, Mark, 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 over there, over there. That looks like Arthur Baker. He goes, it is Arthur Baker. It is Arthur Baker. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, and and that's 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 Jelly B. John Benny says, John, yeah, yeah, that's John, yeah. And and, okay. and is and that I mean, I, I I don't know, is that John Roby? Yeah, that's John Roby, right? And I'm like, what what are they doing here? And he goes. What do you mean? What are they doing here? They're here to fucking hear you play, man. And I'm like, no shit, really. So I then suddenly, and I, this was me getting carried away in the moment. I really wanted to meet these guys, but when Mark said they're here to meet you, it's I, I I rarely do this, but one time I left, I was like, hey guys, how you doing? You know, and all this like, and and like you know, even and like Arthur, Arthur remembers that. John remembers that, and so when John's in, John Benitez is in the UK. And, and we're at say Liverpool Disco Festival. He he comes straight comes straight to see me, and that's like thirty. Same like I did. Thirty years. Same like I did. Exactly, no, exactly, exactly. And you know, and then that was went so well that Mark got me to come and play at Mars. I think it was every two months um, on a Sunday or something. And that was suddenly I was flying to New York regularly. And getting to know the city and getting to make friends, and and then not long after that, I was on a plane. Me and Mike were on a plane to Australia to play to do a tour of Australia, and then basically from eighty nine right up until my uh, twins were born in two thousand and four, I was just constantly travelling uh, around the world. And again, I kept thinking to myself, "When's this going to end?" Because I'm I never wanted to do this, and here I am getting paid to do it. Travel, traveling British Airways first class to Hong Kong to do a gig. You know, it's just crazy. But like I say, you never take yourself seriously. From New Aberdeen town up way up north. And he gets yeah. to Nottingham and then everything changes. Jesus. I know. I know. It's, it's, the thing is. And the question is, 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 what shit did you step in, mate? <laughs> I know. No, exactly. But it's, it's I, I, I think, I, I, I mean, like, I, I, you, you, your, your label, Karmic Power. 
I'm a firm believer in karma. You get what you give back, you know. And if you are, if you've got the right attitude and you don't piss people off and you don't get big headed and arrogant and egotistical, and come on, there's enough arrogant, egotistical, big headed DJs uh, around. I'm not going to mention any names, but I some, we all know them. But I sometimes I find myself on a flight and you think, God, oh, just listen to yourself. Just shut up. Nobody knows who you are. We're on a flight to Australia. Nobody knows who you are. But stop acting, giving it the big I am. Or what I laugh at when I go to Ibiza is all these like young, <laughs> talented DJs. I admit, yeah, very good talented DJs. But the way they, they dress and get on the plane is like a, may as well have a big arrows going, look at me. I'm the DJ. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I think, and go and sit down and shut up. Jing, jing, he's here. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, but then it, that's probably a generational thing. To me, you know, a DJ is someone right. who right. just plays right. great music. You're right. He just plays great music, you know? I, I mean, before social media, what did you do? You you, you used to do your, you have to do, the, the best way to advertise yourself was to do a great DJ set, but obviously, but, to give out cassettes of your set, of your DJ sets, and to do the charts in Blues and Soul magazine and Record Mirror, and to maybe just be a nice person and let people know what you're doing. You know, it wasn't about playing, uh, doing a live stream from atop the most expensive hotel in the world in Dubai in the middle of a pandemic. It's, it was nothing to do with that, you know? It was nothing to do with um, playing on top of a, Multi, a skyscraper in Manhattan and saying some cheesy shit on a microphone about someone who died. It's not nothing to do with that. It's just about, hey, listen, guys, I've got some great music here. I'm going to play it. If you like it, great. We'll have a great, we'll have a great time. You know, people didn't, people, okay, at Hacienda, people, it was a bit unnerving to start with. People would look up at me and Mike, but they were just looking up to the heavens, I think. Whereas now, now you, you see what? some. They did look up to you guys because those were the days where the boots were really high. Mm. The clubs were. 20 feet high, we were. 20 feet really high. high. That booth was because I remember playing there. It was a high booth. Yeah, exactly. But um, I don't know, just attitudes, attitudes change. But I just, I just like, I hate, I hate the expression old school because it implies that you're stuck in a time. But I don't mind the expression old school when it comes to attitude, right? And I think my attitude is old school. It's about camaraderie. It's about looking out for each other. It's about doing the best you can without stepping on other people's toes and without shouting from the rooftops that you are the best because you get more money than this person and you got more social media followers. That's just the way things have gone. And, you know, that's fine. I'm, I'm not knocking it. I've got no time for people who slag individuals off being a certain way i just concentrate my own game and um i like to think that what i do today is the same as what i did when i started i play great music that i like and people happen to like what i play but uh, technology has democratized the whole djing process it's easier to put a mix together it's easier to, to, to obtain music but what technology can't do and will never do is decide what record to play next? That's the that's the real skill, and that's the real talent. You cannot teach anyone that. I've got kids who I've talked to. DJ. My mom's eighty six. I can she can put a mix together right using with the help of technology. That's a beautiful thing to see. My eighty six year old mom with her headphones on doing that. But um, but you take someone who may have the greatest tech setup in the world, and you say, right, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put you in a small club with a low ceiling 500 people it's going to be very dark and here's some music that you might not be that familiar with entertain everyone and, and, and i think a lot of people would struggle i, I did a gig once in uh, sterling a soul uh, night in sterling in scotland and it was when i was using serato so they had turntables and um, so i had my serato box well the mixer was so old it, you couldn't connect anything to it. Everything was sealed. So I had my laptop, I had my Serato uh, box, and my Serato vinyl, and there was no way of connecting it. Now, what do you do? You turn around and you see that all the DJs have got brought with them 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of 12 inch singles, seven inch singles, albums, but sing everything right on vinyl. And I'm like, well, if nobody objects, I'll just and I look through and records. grab some, yeah, material. yeah. And they go, is that okay? Because they were fully because, because apparently some DJs, and I'm not gonna mention names, but I've no DJs who go like, this is not on my rider, this is not what I ordered. I'm out of here, right? Okay, that's you're gonna leave hundreds of people disappointed, right? Or thousands of people disappointed. So I started flicking through, and there's like, first thing I found was Stellar Funk 12 inch by Slave. Okay, we're gonna play that. Good look. Oh, more bounce to the ounce by Zap. No, now, second one up. That, yeah, that'll go in. And oh, there's yeah. some funkadelic here. Oh, look at this. There's some Michael Jack. Yeah, Michael Jackson's good. And oh, Quincy Jones. That's uh, stuff oh i i, I recognize this artist i'm not familiar with him but i know that it's a so I'll, I'll listen to my own and i put together one of the greatest sets i ever did but there was no way of recording it right and all the vinyl wasn't mine and it was the, one of the greatest nights ever i don't think uh um you can't teach anyone how to do that and i don't think if you took some kid who's super talented and made had his own amazing production and label and and was really focused on what you do if you said can you just go and use these old records you don't know very well i i'm not convinced that, that they could do that because the training's different and and i'm not saying the passion's different it's just people focus on 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 different things you know beat well, port. what's in the what, what's in the beat port top 10 hang on i'm not the interested technology in with the sync buttons made everyone become a dj that necessarily would not have to learn the art form of the change of the mix the understanding of the phrase exactly that all that well, exactly for the well, button now i know this i mean this, i'm not knocking I, I i never used it but i would never use I'm it telling I, you, I that's, could, that's the generation now so when we talk about know. change pioneer has made it and then den on and the rest we'll just say the, the yeah. pioneer generation that came after the turntable they have this thing called the sync button you don't need I know to learn how to dj i mean excuse me no exactly i had a beat match beat mix no exactly you just select exactly. Records, drag and drop so you become more like a, a what i would call a controller than I yeah would exactly sir I, I mean i do use the pioneers and the usbs because i love what you can do with them you know you, i don't use a sync button but the the loops and and the way you can can jump between cue points and everything that's that's a creative thing and that's good but you still got to do it in a way that isn't too self-indulgent in a way that sounds great to a club and i think if you've got that vinyl training and that vinyl mixing background that influences how you use the technology that's why i love serato with 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 vinyl controllers so so much because you can you can just mix digital files just like you're playing with vinyl and, and cut up to copy. certain DJs. This is the problem I have. They sound too perfect all night. Mm. No mistakes. There's no light. You're like, wait a minute. There's nothing human about this. It sounds so I know. I, I know. A little double but, beating, no feel change, no off yeah. time. And it's okay. That stuff is okay in the night. It's okay. I know. But at the risk of sounding cocky, and I never sound cocky, can I just say I've spent the past, I've spent a lot, a lot of lockdown digitizing and remastering old DJ sets from cassette from Hacienda and the garage annoying him. And you know what? I've not heard any mistakes that I've made yet. <laughs> but that's because to me, I think as a musician, saxophone player in a band. Timing's and every I, timing. And I took that to, and, and, and it's all about the gentle touch and going, Oh, I can't push that because it's a, it's a long held string. And if I push it too much, it'll go, whoa. So you'd learn a little, I'll pull this one down instead of pushing that one up. And so, you know, it's it's just stuff you learn on the road. But nobody nobody taught me. Now you can go to DJ school and learn how to mix. And that's great. And be a rock like, star. You can learn to be a rock star. Get the training but, at the gym to get all buffed and ready and then go get your oh, that's not. That's I'm too late for that. He's got the guns. <laughs> Graham's got those guns in his head. Graham, what's the what's the the, pro the progression for you to the studio? When did that happen? Because we know about the record shop, we know about Hacienda, we know you're playing all over England, we know you came to America. When did the remixing begin? Like you know, right? I um I used I was familiar with the recording studio because when I was in a band, we made demos and we recorded, right? Um, and then when I started DJing, um, there was a guy who lived in Derby who owned a recording studio called Square Dance. 
and him and his he, he owned the studio and his friend was an engineer and they said listen you know why don't you come over to, come and see us in derby with we, we think we should maybe do something because you know i'm i own the studio john's a great engineer and you're the dj i went yeah well so i went and made them said we want to set up a record label so we set up submission records and, and we started off putting out hip-hop and kind of uh soulful house stuff very basic using you know two inch tape yeah with a simty with a simty code yep. using a, de a desk with no automation so you had to put, ride those faders and if you didn't mute the, the the congas at the right time it was stop rewind let's go again all that run again, and then, run again. <laughs> yeah run again and then uh if you wanted to do the the edit the seven inch edit it was it was like one inch tape and a razor blade and a china graph i loved that i absolutely loved it and even now when i'm editing sometimes i put it in slip mode instead of like um holding it and i go no i'm gonna just gonna zoom in and and do it visually i still do that now i love it uh the engineer hates it because go, but it won't be perfect i said i don't care if it sounds perfect that's good enough for me that's right but then we well, had sounds like a dm exactly. exactly and then if you then we'd have uh, the engineer said, we're going to start using a, a computer. A computer? Yeah, an Atari 1040 STFM. And we're going to link that to the SIMPTI code. And then that means the 909 drum machine and the 808 drum machine will sync up with the computer. And that was like, whoa. And then, of course, the Akai S900 came along oh, with kilobytes, kilobytes of sampling on it. Right, so we're doing all that and, and producing music and writing music and releasing it, and then I think it was uh, a guy at MCA Records called Adrian uh, Sykes, uh, who used to come to to hear me at the garage in Nottingham and came to see me play in London. And said, "Oh, uh, I like some of the stuff you put out. Uh, do you want to remix an Eric B and Rakim track for me?" Um, I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> so I started re I started remixing and, and I my early remixes were Eric B and Rakim. Um my well, who did the Mighty Hard Rocker? It was on Sleeping Bag. Cash Money, Mighty Hard Rocker on Sleeping Bag, because there's a guy called Mervyn Anthony. And then I just basically because I knew everyone, everyone in the record industry used to come to Hacienda. So they would basically ask me to, to start doing remixes, and that's how I kind of learned how other people made records because you'd get the two inch tape would be sent up to Derby and you'd, it was a copy. So you'd listen to it and go, well, I don't want any of these tracks. So you wipe them and then you'd keep the stuff you wanted to keep, but then you start sampling the vocals and chopping them up and putting it all into the Atari. We use, we use software in the Atari called pro 24. So you only had 24 tracks. I think pro, I was thinking that was the, the, the precursor to pro tools. That's, I mean, I, I still use Pro Tools. Oh, and Cubase, early Cubase. That's right. Early Cubase is what we used as well. Um, um, yeah, that was one of the first that worked on the Atari computer because you have to put that's a, right. Put a disc yeah. loaded with the disc drive. I remember that. Yeah, the loads of floppy disks, everything. Because I remember, with, like now, with with, with there's always memory um, on computers. You can just copy paste, copy paste to your heart's content. But it, with the early Cubase, there was hardly any memory in the Atari. So you had to make ghost copies that didn't take up as much memory. So you'd have your, your four bars with your master part, but then the, you made ghost copies. So you couldn't change. If you change the original part, the ghost copies change. Anyway, that's all getting very technical. Um, and then, of course, when I started working at Hacienda with Mike, um, he always said that me and him should do something together. And to sink in beautifully with your last two guests your last two guests yeah, being everybody this is the drum roll we had lee last week imagination yep. he's going to tell you now how he works with imagination as well now here we go so i started working with mike pickering at hacienda and he of course was already in the music industry with deconstruction records and and he, he'd like the remix that i was doing and, and he said that i think I, should, I think we should do a remix i said yeah i think we should and then he phones me up and said listen you know that studio you're using, Derby? Can we book it? I said, why? I said, I've got us a remix. I said, oh, my God, the first ever Park Pickering remix. Of course, Mike said, no, the first ever Pickering Park remix. I'm like, no, <laughs> alphabetical Park Pickering. So um, I said, what is it? He says, it's, it's just an illusion by imagination. I'm like, no way, one of the greatest records ever. And the two-inch tape arrived in Derby, and Mike came down from Manchester, and we queued it up. 
and we we remixed our first remix together was um um just illusion by imagination we didn't really do much to we just changed the drums i um did the new piano solo and a piano riff but did that old trick of because i can play keyboards i can do basic stuff anyone who's seen hassi and the classical will know i do very basic stuff uh, but what i did that old trick of we slowed the tempo to half speed and i did this amazing half speed piano and then you listen back to it and that's me playing the piano and people go wow parky that's an amazing piano solo i'm like yeah thank you but yeah. of course you know that's the great thing about technology it lets you do that and of course from then mike and i did a few remixes but then we decided to to do our own music as the dynasty of two and we recorded a track that was released on deconstruction called stop this thing and the lead vocalist that we got for it was rowetta and this was oh, 1989 yes. yeah yes and it was stop this thing the dynasty of two which is me and mike with rowetta on vocals and then the b-side which i still play now because it's amazing even though i say to myself it's called energy and it's just it was very late in the night and mike was you know wanted to have a get his head down and had to get Rowetta back to Manchester. And I said, we need a B-side. And we just put this uh, drum loop in and a sample. And I just played this, din -din -din -din, this Latin, two, two Latin chords, right? And then used, you know, the, you know, Notice Me by Sandy. Yes. The sample that goes, and just had that going through it. Honestly, look at that, Dynasty of Two Energy. And I honestly, I'm still so proud of that. One of the first things I did with Mike, and I, and I love it. And then I just ended up in the 90s, remixing in a city and brand new heavies and and um here's a question Luther Bandros, yeah the piano the piano chords the big piano breakdowns and the handbag sound yeah what would you say would be the one of the first records you remember that broke through what? in that you know that staple sound that was to come well, it, that's it. I, I've never thought about this before, but immediately when you said that, my, my brain starts going back to, to, to like when I started DJing. And I think probably the first big house tune with a big piano breakdown, if you flip it over and don't play the main version, but play the B-side, was Marshall Jefferson's house music anthem. The way it, it breaks down, dun, 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 and the big gap, dun, 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 and then, of course, Todd Terry sampled the, the, the for his um, "Can You Feel It?" And then, but then, of course, that very basic raw piano breakdown, everyone's off their heads, loving it. Developed in the nineties as something a bit more lush and a bit more jazzy and a bit more soulful. So instead of like like two simple, a few fingers going d d on short chords, became like down down down. Uh, and and people would love it. And of course, the the the, the amazing David Morales, his '90s remixes, whether it was Donna Summer or Mariah Carey or or, or even lesser well-known people, um, um, and, and Frankie Knuckles with his, his his remember Let There Be Love, the Frankie Knuckles yes. mix, Shirley Murdoch. Yes. Oh, those records just took that breakdown to a whole lush level. So it wasn't just the piano, the drums. The percussion, they would all say, right, let's all let's pull those back and then the bass will break down, just leave the piano, but then lush strings and pads on top. And then everything would then either slowly build up or suddenly come back, but not necessarily on the beat. I, I love it when things come back on the off beat and it's like, and it's on the off beat and no stupid, unnecessary. 64 bar drum rolls to get you out of it we didn't nobody needed that in those days i think i remember you playing seven housing authority or someone those records oh. that, that was your record i mean you yeah said, all i'm asking that yeah mm. seven housing. that's another big piano track like you pianos know? pianos in the hacienda we just made for each other whether it was um, raw chicago house music whether it was um slightly more well-produced new york house music or whether it was Italian, um, Italo house, you know, yep. like all that kind of stuff. It, it, pianos just work, don't they? They just work. I mean, even now, like the, David Morales has got this new single out with Real Soul and Carla Prada. No, DJ Spen and Carla Prada. I and love all the it is, version too. I it's see. a dun, 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 
for six minutes. That's all it does. And it's, and it's got a nice... And it's beautiful. It's, it's fabulous. It's fabulous. I, again, you can overthink music, I think. You can overthink it. And um, it's a great record. But then you, 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 uh, you as well, Lenny, come on. Let's talk about... Just turn around for a minute. You've made some amazing club records over the years. And as I was telling you earlier, when I'm going through my 150 new music promos a day that I get to my email address, oh, my God. Oh, there's a karmic power. That's Lenny Fontana. And it goes straight on. You know, you listen thank to you. it. So, I, I have come on. to say to everybody, thank you all the time for you rocking our joints. They, it means the world to me. That I'm still, but they're great joints. They're great joints. You know what I mean? In the sense of that they're still accepted because uh, it's not easy to keep trying to churn out, you know, records that make a difference. Let's put it like that. No, exactly. But I'm guessing that you do it for the passion and it's because it's, oh, I lo you love, I love doing it. feeling that you, I can, ex yeah. I can understand exactly when you're saying that you still had that feeling when you were a young guy. That, that no, exactly. That if that goes, then you're in trouble. Aren't you? When you get that feeling, I know what you mean. I still get excited. People hear me all the time talking. That's what makes it difficult at the moment because uh, in the summer I managed to, I was very lucky to do five outdoor socially distanced events. What? They weren't great. Yeah, five outdoor socially distanced events. Watch. Where the hell's my job? I know, I know. But then of course the weather changes and then the, the, the rules change and the virus gets worse. So it's not going to happen. So it is really, really difficult. Live streaming has helped, but it doesn't, it's not the same as meeting people, seeing people, hugging people get in the atmosphere and feeding off a crowd because sometimes you might go to a club and have a really good idea in your head what you want to do but then as soon as you get there you realize well it's not going to work because the dj who's on now has got a completely oh, different a, vibe ask you hang on don't yeah. go nowhere hang on what do you look for from a, a warm-up dj come when you're getting ready to play like what are you expecting as a dj well yourself? straight away i've got to tell you that i was very lucky um when Mike left the Hacienda to go and do M People and I moved to Saturdays, I uh, got a warm-up DJ who turned out to be the greatest warm-up DJ ever. And he still is an amazing DJ. His name is Tom Wainwright. And he... Ooh, another, another great classic name, Tom Wainwright. Yes. He, he, he would warm up the crowd beautifully. He never... He only... Well, I say never. Once... He did something he shouldn't have, but I let him off because it was the right thing to do. But he just played beautiful kind of vibe, warming the crowd up, never just got them ready. And then I'd go, and, and it, it wasn't like you're going to play till this time that I'm going to take over. The way it worked with Tom was, I would just go, hey, Tom, I'm ready. And he would never complain and go, okay. Sometimes that would be, he'd only do an hour and a half and I'd say, I'm ready. And he'd go, okay. Other times he'd do two and a half hours. I'm like, We'd love listening to him. And I thought, well, he's have, he's working the crowd, right? The only time he annoyed me was because I was um, when he played um, an, uh, an Express 2 record that I'd driven up from London, couldn't wait to drop this Express 2 record. He plays. And, he, and, and I said, Tom, I'm ready. And he went, I'll just put one more on. And he put it on and I was like, what the? But then I thought, <laughs> no, it's the right record at the right time. And anyway, it was such a big record that four hours later, this was in the days when Hacienda was open till 4 a.m. I just played it again anyway. But Tom could read the crowd, right? He didn't try and steal, the, whether it was me or a guest, he just he played to the crowd and got them ready. That's what a warm-up should do. Sometimes, okay, I'm not going to mention this, sometimes you play somewhere and, and, and the, 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 the warm-up DJ is playing hit after hit, banger after banger, but the crowd aren't going for it because they're going like, it's 10 o'clock. What are you doing? Yeah, but then, but the thing early. is, what are you doing? It is too early. But I see, personally, I don't mind that because sometimes you think, well, great. If he's playing these obvious records, it means I don't have to worry about them. I can go somewhere else. And so you let them do their thing, reach a crescendo. Thank you very much. Leave a little gap of 20 seconds and then go on a different tip and then do something else. I think, but it's understandable because some people, See, they see it as a big break. Um, again, I, I mean, when I, I, when I first, the only time I got really nervous about playing with a big name, and again, this is a true story for true house stories. It was 1989, I think, maybe, yeah, 1989, and uh, Sleeping Bag Records brought Todd Terry to the UK, his first ever gig in the UK, 
was at the WAG Club in London. And they said, Graham, will you, will you uh, play warm up for Todd? I'm like, Todd Terry, the great Todd Terry, whose records I play, is coming to London. You want me? Oh, my, his first ever gig. And I was quite nervous, right? And I met him, nice guy. Um, and I went and did the thing. And then his manager at the time said, uh, Todd wants to go on now. I'm like, whatever Todd wants, he can go on now. So I'm really excited. I wanted, I wasn't leaving the club because I knew I was going back on after him. And I wanted to hear Todd Terry, right? I was so excited. So Todd Terry got in the booth and I left the booth. And for the next hour and a half, he was amazing. Every single record he played, I'm at the bar, I'm on the dance floor going, I've got this record. I've got this record. I'm like, this is amazing. So when somebody said, uh, Graham, Todd says he wants you to go back on. Great. Went back to the DJ booth. Todd, that was amazing. It was, Thank you very much. And then I looked around the DJ booth and sort of, what the fuck? What's happened to my records? Because I used to always make sure my record went back in the, in the right sleeve, back in the box. My records were fucking everywhere. Why? Because, oh, sorry, I, I, I forgot to mention, my records never turned up from, from oh, Peter shit. Heathrow. <laughs> and I just thought it was okay to use yours. And I, obviously I was furious, but I was like, Todd, it's cool, man. It's, it's, cool. it's fine. Man. It's all it's good. Fine. And I, but I was really pissed off. <laughs> but then off you went. But then, so at the end of the night, I'm like, I spent about an hour while they're cleaning the club going like, where's the red sleeve to go with this? Where's the <laughs> yellow and black sleeve for my fresh record? You know what I mean? That, but that was amazing. But then, then screaming at everybody, that. where the effing crap is my this? Who tell him exactly. to play? It? It's gone already. I know. This is the wrong inner sleeve. This is the wrong inner sleeve. Be this is an American. People, is, we get the true house story. But then, but then Todd remembers that, and 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 and, and Todd, I've, we've been friends ever since, and he's one of, again. Todd is a lovely guy. Oh, he's, he's a great guy. guy. He's a great guy. He's a great guy, and and but a lot of a lot of that kind of era are you know like what well, you are um and todd is and and the late frankie was just the greatest you know well, always we're approachable had, had we're all approachable we were all yeah, yeah. this the new yeah. generation's a bit more they because they're built up from the record labels they're already being built up like their stars you, you're going to be huge you're the biggest thing ever you hear them they talk and you meet them and they're talking to me like like i'm like way down on the totem pole of crap it's like Okay, go ahead, go do your thing. Go ahead. Here's a question: when you when you DJ about you, I get it. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. When you here's a question for you: when you DJ in uh, New York, right? Is it just you turn up and do your thing, or do you have a road manager or a tech guy when you're in DJ in New York? It's the same way. I I did. Nobody was with me except me. Exactly. So why why do DJs now? Right? I I don't get this. When DJs have said, well, I don't, you'll need to pay for my uh, tech manager or my road manager. You're like, you're a DJ. What the hell do you need? We need Someone. What, hey, we need a full staff. But what? I don't get it. I do <laughs> not get it. You know, but, but people say to me, so it's like, okay, we, so we agree a fee because I do a lot of bookings directly now because it saves all the the complications the agents agents can agents can complicate things sometimes and then we talk about the flights and the hotel and and everything and go okay so um what about what about any crew any i'm like what crew no i'm just going to turn up either with my laptop and serato stuff or a usb and headphones and you're going to look after me and we're going to party and they're like oh my god i can't believe it and they love it they love it they just i can't even I don't get like you you know? Because it's not. It, maybe my dad's right. It's not a proper job, is it? It's just I get. It's I've spent thirty nine eighty four. That's thirty seven years Same as me. getting paid <laughs> to have a great time and play play music. There's been highs. There's been lows. Um, and I've learned a lot. But one thing I've learned, uh, and it's a dead cheesy line. It's nice to be important, but it's surely it's more important this. to be nice. What's hey? really important? This is the most important. So you come in, you got hit records happening. Everybody wants to meet you. The problem is with the DJ booth, it's a magnet. It's the center force of the world. Yeah, I know, but I know. Here's the problem, everybody. This is not the time when Graham Parker and myself are DJing to come and bar. I know. I, I, then and then. I know. Because they're it, all going, Graham, Graham, Graham. Yo, I'm I just, know. I, I, I've never understood that. 
that was the beauty of the Hacienda DJ box. It had a stable door. So people would knock on the door. So <laughs> yeah. the bottom half, the bottom half stays, stays closed. You open the top half and go, not now, not now, maybe later. No, you can't come in. Boom. Mm. But a lot, of D, a lot of DJ boxes now, um, s- promoters and their friends, they all want to hang out and behind you and, and, and can I have a sell? I'm like, no, please. But the thing is, I don't get annoyed by it because if you get annoyed, it's going to affect your DJ set. It's going to affect your performance. So you have to kind of just de- roll with it and deal with it. So again, I go in my contract, it says things like the, the promoter agrees that nobody will be in the DJ box unless agreed in advance. And so you can say, where's the promoter? Listen, can you just please get rid of everyone? Oh, but that's my best friend or that's my girlfriend. I'm like, I know, but you know, maybe come back later. So you have to, you have to, you have to address it sometimes. Um, but what's more annoying, people still bring their coats and bags to the DJ booth, or or, or if they can't get to the DJ booth, we'll try and push them up the front. I know like, what you're doing. Or if it's a really intimate venue, and it's maybe you play an early slot because you're playing somewhere else, and it's very relaxed, and someone will come up and go. Whoa, what have you got? <laughs> what have I got? Or, or they ask you, I know, listen, here's a good one. If you play this record next, I guarantee everyone will go crazy. And I'm like, no shit, really? But I haven't got it. No, 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 no. But you've got to play it. I haven't got it. Why haven't you got it? I don't like it. Yeah, but it's a big song. I don't care if it's a big song. I mean, I there are, there are big club tunes that I don't like. And I won't play them. Because I don't like them. I can't genuinely play a record I don't like. And even worse, if I haven't got it, how can you play? Okay, I've got it on my phone. I've got it on my phone. What's the one record you despise? They asked you over and over and you said, hell no. Wow, there are are so many, uh, but I don't want to be be unfair. I can't. I'll tell you one from me. There was a time there was a record called Hands Up came out, and they used to do it in Club Med. This in the 80s. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. yeah, yeah. They make us. Can you play the Hands Up? No. Please, mm. I'll give you 100. No. I don't care if you give me 1,000. No, I'm not playing this record. It's crap. Okay. Uh, it's not a record. It's a band. Okay. It's controversial. It's controversial. And I'm going to say this, and people are going to go, oh, okay. I can't believe that. And I've never played a record by them. I might have when I when I was on radio Saturday night primetime radio. I may have played them, but, but then that's that's what Saturday night primetime radio is about. But I cannot play in a club. And I've never played in a club because I I I I I know they're massive. I know they're cutting edge and groundbreaking. People love them, but I really don't like. And I'm sorry, it's controversial, but no. I don't I don't like Daft Punk. Okay. <laughs> I just I, I get it, but it's just not for me. Okay, I, for me. No, I get it. I get it. it looks- Parky, put Daft Punk on. No. <laughs> Piss off. You're kidding, right? No, seriously. I'm, don't wind me up. It's I, just me. It's just it, my it, thing, you, you know. I don't know when you're serious. Because even when you're serious, you're making a slap. <laughs> no. I don't I mean I get him. I get it. I get it, but you know you have all around uh, the world. It's all right. <laughs> It's okay. There's better records out there. That year, there was amazing. I think, you know, oh, people yeah. people put too much emphasis on particular acts. But to me, it's always been about tracks and the music. And yes, Masters at Work were amazing, but not everything was amazing. Most of it was, let's be honest. Um, but, you know, I, to me, it's about individual tracks, really. Uh, I have, there are, there are producers and artists, like I mentioned, Masters at Work, um, Louis and and Kenny and uh, that that can do no wrong, mainly. But you see, to me, and I, do you remember the days when um, you'd get your Strictly Rhythm white label? It was it was literally a white label. It didn't even have anything on it. It was it was a white sleeve, white label, and it had um, a typed photocopied sheet that often Gladys Pizarro herself had typed out. Right, right. Of one sheet, we saw the one sheet inside. Prom would give me exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it was the same with Nervous Records. And, and more, if you've got white labels, what I used to do, I, and I, lo- I used to love doing this, go, oh, some white labels. And I would make a point of taking the white label out of the sleeve without reading the letter, right? And you'd know if it was American, because it was where it's pressed, or, or British. And I'd put it on and play it and go, right, now this is really good. I like this. But I don't know who it is. I wonder who it is. 
then you'd open up the letter and go, wow, I might never have even put this at the top of my pile. Or sometimes put something on and go, nah, it's all right. It's, I can live without it. Then you'd pull the thing out and it'd be remixed by someone well-known or it'd be by someone well-known. So I think in an ideal world, you should everyone should listen to every new record without knowing who it's on, not what label it's on, not who's produced it, not who's a and would it, not what brand is behind it. No. Listen to everything on its merits. Unfortunately, that's not how it works because now it's about the brand. It's about the label. It's about the club night that's associated with the brand and the label. And that's fine. That's what people expect. You know, that's, you know, Ministry of Sound, Head Candy, um, whatever. So, go, you know. The problem is, mate, Graham, I'll tell you what the problem what? is. People have gotten time constraints now. Here's the problem. You're getting tons they of. They have. So what do they do? They only check the fr- and. I'm, I check everything, but I know this. They check the first mix. Yeah. Mind you, there could be four or five mixes. I've sometimes gone down to the fourth mix. Mm-hmm. And, oh, my God. This is incredible. I know. I do that. Not a big but you, name. And they're better than a big name mix. Exactly. But you get a vibe. But you, I don't know about you, but you, you can get a vibe as well. Well, yeah, I know I'm going to like there's this. Some labels down, there's so many new labels that you're getting all these promos. And, you, and even though you're not sure, you check them. And then you just go quickly, listen, quickly, listen, listen. And you go, oh, my God, that's awesome. I like that. Put that in the pile. I, I agree. But I do think that if you remember the double 12-inch single, I hated that. Because I always take the view that if a record's great, it needs one or two mixes three tops and the double 12 inch came along and spoiled that you'd have every type of genre and that carries on today and so many people are desperate to do remixes that labels go okay then we can't pay you but we'll put it on there and we'll give you some points and there's too many mixes and i think a great record is a great record and if people don't buy into it and they don't love it never mind go and do something else but you know this i don't want to mention artists and labels but there's I was reading today that a big tune from last year that maybe wasn't as big as it could have been is back out soon with new mixes. And I'm like, <laughs> what, was wrong, what, was wrong, what was wrong with the first mixes? It, 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 it really winds me up. But then it doesn't matter because that's just my opinion. And well, people... is the reason why it's happening is because social media, people are missing things first time around. So what they're doing is repackaging to push it back out mm, again. That's I know. trying to extend the life on some things. But it's fine. That's how it works. And people love that and people expect that and it's great another thing that annoys me is people calling records vinyls there's no bloody s on the end of vinyl it's vinyl not vinyls but that's another thing but talking of the way labels work and you said there's so many labels and so on, not a good time to be involved in the launch of a new label but I can't tell you anymore except look out. I'm involved in the launch of a new label soon. <laughs> but we're going to try. We're going to try and do it. Like wait, I said, wait, buddy, one... hold on. wait, wait. Another true house moment. We've got a new label coming out. I can't tell you much about it, but he's going to no, be. I can't... It. Okay. That's... No, because, oh. we have, because we're still going to just uh, finish it, finalize a distribution deal and hope that that amazing first record that I'm going to release, that the, the guy's not fed up waiting for me to, to, to sign it off. But, um, Honestly, it's just uh, you'll be the first, one of the first to know, Lenny. I promise. But it's it's going to be tough you know, because you know, you know you know we do announce the records. We gave Byron Stingley on his Ten City album a big big push last week. <gasps> Listen, Byron, I, I I made a record with him about ten years ago called Shady, and I mean that is you just reminded me. I'm going to dig that out because I think yeah. that to, to to completely contradict myself and go back in what I've just said. That deserves to be heard again <laughs> with new mixes. Oh, okay, with Lenny, your- <laughs> do you want to, Lenny, do you want to remix a Byron Stewart record? I did problem, let's ago? check it out. Send it out to me right away. In fact, do you want to remix? I'm putting this point. Do you want to remix a track that I've done with Natasha Watts that is going to come out on this new label? I'll send it to you. Let me know what you think. It's very soulful. Everyone I can hear, I can hear a Lenny Fontana mix on it already. <laughs> Who has stories? We unearthed. Well, you know what? I wish I wish I was sat in the room with you now because we could just talk all night and then we'd start playing music, wouldn't we? I know. We, the problem with playing music is they'll, shut, they'll bring the cops and shut us down. No, I know. But what we? But if I was there now, we'd finish oh, the broadcast. Yeah, we, oh yeah. And then and you'd go, hey, check this out. I've been working on it for the past it. two weeks. And then I'd go, oh, listen, what? Try this on it. Try that on it. And then we'd make a record. Now let me tell something to everybody, <laughs> and maybe you can give us a like. 
on this. And I've said this over and over. People ask me these questions. I'm also just joined Clubhouse, the new app on Apple. And I've been going into different. <sighs> oh, hang on, hang on. Hosh yeah, yeah. got a, a thing going on from Hosh Gorelli used to be at, used to work with Clive Davis at Ariston Drive Records, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I got a question asked to me. I'm going to ask you the same way. Yeah. Back in the day, what do you miss the most? My answer mm. was the record shop. And the reason yes. why I said was because I ran into everyone in the music industry at the record shop. And I also found out all the dirt and there's <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of business out of it because people would find out you did a record, you would start chit chatting. And next thing you knew, syn the synergy of the excitement of the music playing without mm -hmm. having a bar in a sense, the music playing and all that happening around you. Is that something that you can, you know, talk, on your end about the record shop, like how important that was back in the day to what it is now? It was, it was really, really important. I, when I lived in London, uh, all, all the years I went to the Hacienda, by the way, I lived in London. I, I didn't move to Manchester until the Hacienda closed to, to, to go on the radio. Uh, but um, I used to go to Black Market uh, in, in Soho twice a week. And how it worked was the guys behind the counter would put a pile of 12-inch of, of singles to one side and I would go in and go, hi, oh, here, are. here's your records. And I would take back the ones I didn't want and keep the ones I wanted. But when you're in there, you'd see people you knew, like Ashley Beadle would be in there, right? Um, and you say, hey, Ashley, how are you doing? And, chat. and then a record would come on while you're having that conversation. And you go, oh, wow, what's this? Is it in my pile? No, it's not in my Why pile. Why is it not well, in my pile? Yeah, give I it want it in my pile. So then they go, oh, so if you like this, then maybe we should try these in your pile as well. Brilliant. That's gone. That's gone. You, you cannot beat a, a, a fellow human being making uh, a suggestion based on what you just said. Filling your basket on Beatport, which I do from time to time, and it's great, is, 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 is the modern equivalent. But where that ends is when, when it comes up at the bottom of the screen, you should check these out. I'm like, well, no, that's an algorithm that's suggested it. I'm not going to interest it just because other people have bought that or the algorithm says it's the same genre. I, I refuse. I refuse to do it. And equally, uh, you open up Beatport. What's the first thing that comes up? The Beatport, not, not Beatport. I don't use Beatport. Track source. They open up track source. And the first thing that comes up is a track source top 10. I try not to look at it. Try not to look at it because I'd rather find things myself, you know? Right. Uh, and, and, and a good thing about record shop is, you know, I, I, I got into, I tell you, I, I, I love, I, I've never DJed this. I've never played this as a DJ set. I love drum and bass and I love jungle. Why? Because when I used to go into Black Market, Nikki Black Market would be playing drum and bass. And I thought, oh, this is amazing. What is it? And he'd tell me what it was. Oh, put it in my pile. So he'd, he'd feed me these drum and bass records. And I used to love playing them at home. Even now, if I'm driving to a gig, and I leave the club at 4 a.m. and I'm driving home. I listen to drum and bass in the car at 4 a.m. Driving home on the on a quiet motorway. Wow. I love it. And I, and I got that from going to, to Black Market. I've never been to a drum and bass club. Never been to had a DJ doing a drum and bass set. Why? Because I understand there's a lot of MCing going on. And I just can't be doing that. But I love it. I love listening to, to drum and bass. But you're right. Record shops were, were like a community. Now, a, a young, a younger generation, an up and coming generation will argue. They'll say, "Hey, old man, we have that community. It's <laughs> online." Man. Yeah, and I'm sure you do, and that's fine. Now, Clubhouse that you mentioned, I've had three invites to Clubhouse in the last week, and I haven't taken them up because no disrespect to Clubhouse, no disrespect to what's going on, I'm not interested. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. Man, hang on, that's not fair. <laughs> I got invited from a few people and Hosh turned me on to it. And he's got a huge history in dance music. And he's yeah. doing some panels. And I, I feel like I'm at the um, Winter Music Conference. We're talking. Oh, really? It's that. Nobody's oh, doing anything. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll give it. I'll, I've got. I'm le Please I'm lecturing. join. I'm, lecture, I'm lecturing tomorrow. I'll have a look on Friday. You would be you well on this. A lecturer like you. Okay, I'll have a listen. Listen, but you said Winter Music Conference. Um, I was ne I've never been a fan of that. But what I miss 
and I'm sure we've hung out at this. Do you remember the heady days of the New Music Seminar in yeah. New York? Yeah, I'm right. Late early days. They were the best days. I, de- I got to DJ at Sound Factory Bar and Sound Factory on the same night with Delight on stage playing live. I got to hang out with Tony Humphries, with, with you, with Knuckles, with Tote, and just hanging out in New York yeah, for nice. like five yeah. days. But the, the, the alternative now, the, 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 the Miami Music Conference, I've been and I was, yeah, it's great. But I was just, used to, the, the, the time I went, I was like, I'd rather be in New York. You know, I'd rather be, and it was always when summer turned to spring. So it was getting warm, it was hot, but not too hot. Not so hot that yeah, when you wake up in the spring. morning. It was late spring. That's right. It was brilliant. And and used to go to Tower Records just off um, Times Final Square. Mania. Yeah. Uh, final, and you'd be good, but yeah, but, but so the many thing is you, shops back in, the in the early 90s, you you would go to Tower Records and go to the basement just to buy loads of CDs that weren't out, just like yeah. commercial stuff. Not, you mean you went to like your Vinyl Mania and, and, and your, your, your specialist dance stores for your vinyl, yes, but you always made that one trip for an hour to Tower and load up with, with all the new hip hop CDs and take them back to play in your Walkman on the plane and everything. You know, I just miss, and, and the panels were great fun as well. And oh, I just miss New Music Seminar so much. Like, I remember the big party in Red Zone. It was like, oh, chaotic. the Red Zone parties. Let me see that Red it. Zone. But yeah, I, I remember playing one towards the end of New Music Seminar. I played at, uh, it was just off Times Square Club USA, was it? Yes, that was Club USA. Club, yeah, and, and, and it had it had that that kind of helter skelter tube thing in the middle that went down. And then I remember playing at Limelight, but in the worst DJ booth ever because you couldn't see the dance floor, so you had no idea what was going on. Um, but oh, they was I mean, I just that was that was from eighty nine to maybe late nineties. I was all, just in New York four or five times a year and always DJing. And then, I don't know, something happened towards the end of the 90s. It all got a bit kind of progressive, didn't it? It's like when it suddenly all got about Sasha, Digweed and everything. And, and I'm not knocking that. That's okay. just how it changed, you know? So Junior was playing Sound Factory. Junior leaves Sound Factory and they bring him into another club. Uh, and then mm-hmm. becomes Twilo. And then Twilo begins. That's right. Peter Gation gets Junior. Junior goes uptown. Danny Teneglia steps in. So the music's starting to get darker. Yeah, now I remember I had great nights listening, dancing and dancing. Yeah, he's playing more of that sound yeah. in New York. So a lot of things changed. The soulful house sound is is at one or two clubs and it's yeah. spots. But when you yeah. came, it was still we were still oh, it was driving. amazing. We were still living Paradise Garage in a way. Yeah, still yeah. going. By that time, it was out uh, in the nineties. It was the it was the the grace. I I loved it and. I tell you what, well, it, uh, uh, I've never mentioned this once, but if you see old photographs of me in the late um, 80s, <laughs> no, yeah, the mid late 80s, when I first started going to New York, I looked a lot in a club. I looked a lot like Keith Haring. Now, um, of course, Keith Haring died before I ever got to New York. And one night, it was, it was, a, it was a gay, it might have been a, a, a gay night at Mars, but like this guy was couldn't keep his eyes off me. He and was like, Haring. He was freaking me out, and he was off his nut, and I was a bit off it as well. And he came up and said, "But my God, you look like Keith Haring." And I'm like, "Yeah, people have said that before," and then uh, and it freaked him out, you know. When I first met you, I, you looked reminded me not exactly, but looked like uh, like Moby too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would have been yeah. you knew from Moby, but I knew he wasn't. But just looking at his God, you look similar. Yeah, to the other the other one before um, in the. Nine in the eighties in Nottingham, um, when I used to go to Rock City, people thought I was Michael Stipe, which is quite cool. And then, of course, when I had a massive beard not long ago, people thought it was Michael Stipe as well. But that's quite cool. I don't mind that. But um, so everyone, we're taking a poll. Do we like Graham Park with the Santa Claus <laughs> beard, or do we like this clean? Mesh- well, it's not clean. This is like three weeks, but it's it's very grey, so it looks clean. But I, I I got bored of it. Uh, about it for five him, years and it's, bother him. Tell him what you think of his look, his new look. Are you like it short or long? Two see, house. I'm not. Are you? Is, are you seeing comments? I'm not seeing comments. I'm I mean, you know, yeah, I'm not because I'm seeing on Facebook people writing in. Ah, I'm right, not even okay. um, And him private messages bother him. Tell him. Forget about the music. Tell him about his his look with his beard. This is going. Uh, this is going back to clean shaven tomorrow. I, I'm. I'm. Go to I've work. had a beard for five years. <laughs> 
I mean, there's a, there's, I don't know if you can see this. If I turn this round, there's oh. a picture, a painting on the wall. Yes. Can you see that? Yeah. That's me and my, my beautiful wife. And uh, but I don't miss it. In fact, when I shaved this off, I really enjoyed the whole process of the brush Clean and up. the cream and shit. I loved it. And then I regretted it. I thought, oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> that was three weeks ago, and I and now it's coming back. I'm thinking, people write oh, short, quick. Graham. They like the short look better. Good, because I'm not going to be in a club for, no, for a few months. Yeah, Christian Lockwood short. John Richardson, <laughs> sure. They're already. <laughs> it's going. To, yeah, it's going to go tomorrow. Yeah. Like clean up, mate. Come with the clean look. Put the suit back on. You look. You look like the monkey suit. Get ready. Come on. Time <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything yeah. that we missed? I think we covered everything. Well, has the classical. I mean, we talked about oh, it, but yes. how it came about. Just and very quickly, how it came about um, was there is an older clubber who doesn't go out very often. And they really want to hear the classics. But if you're DJing every week, you don't want to play the class, same classics every week. So that's why we came up with the idea of doing Hussey and the Classical as a one-off. And Peter Hook um, wasn't convinced, but he said, OK, let's do it. And um, it grew and grew and grew into this massive thing. And uh, it's just, we, we reimagine. Who put this, Sorry? who organised this whole? Uh... Well, well, we, we couldn't have done it without Peter Hook because uh, he owns the Hacienda name and his experience of Joy Division and New Order and doing live shows meant good work. The Manchester Camerata, a guy called Tim Crooks, who's the uh, arranger and conductor, and uh, the, 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 all the electronic stuff is me and a guy called Cy Brad that we do it in, in his studio. And uh, we didn't know it would work. It did work. And a, a one-off ended up being a, a five-year tour and we've had to take a, an unfortunate break but we're Why? looking forward to coming back what? <laughs> Why? What's, what's something what's some some reason i don't know are you going but on i will look vacation or are you on a permit vacation? like what, what was it <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to be back maybe hopefully this year but if not next year what's is so the... when realistically do you really think you'll be back really seriously well for big events like proper live concerts i'm i'm i'm, I'm worried it might not be till 2022 i'm hopeful I do a lot of work in the uh, behind the scenes with the Nighttime Industry Association in the UK. I'm hopeful that small scale, low key events um, will can start happening on an outdoor basis. Uh, hopefully this summer. Put it this way: if we don't start, if I don't start getting some income from from live gigs um, by the summer, I might have to go and get another job. <laughs> really, you know what I mean? Um, uh, the last five or six years have been great. So there's money in the bank, but that's money that's supposed to be for the future because we're not getting any younger. Luckily, it's there for now. But, you know. Oh, they didn't tell you to save for a rainy day? Well, I discovered in 2000. They told you. Well, no. I discovered in 2008 when we had the big financial crash that I was really in trouble because everything I had ever earned, I always spent. Right. It's just the nature of our business. When you work for yourself and you're a creative person and you're traveling around all the time, you earn it you spend it the more you earn for example here's something else i forgot to mention in the late 90s early 2000s i was a part-time racing driver and i used to race a classic ferrari and now that money's never coming back but you know what i loved every minute of it but like, we're not here to talk about that um wait, so, wait, 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 wait. now we are here to talk about what do you mean classic where did you race and when did you um, where why i raced I, ra I raced i raced uh a 1979 308 GT for Ferrari 308 GT4 wow. in the Formula Ferrari Classic Series, which was Silverstone. Um, it was Silverstone, Ulton Park, Brands Hatch, all, all the big circuits in the UK. And it cost a fortune and I loved it. And uh, the car, I had me and my wife had twin boys in 2004. And that's when I realized that it's, it's either the twins or the car. So I had to sell the car. And that was my racing career came to an end. Never won anything then, but it was great. But um, I learned in 2008 when I had no money and, and the financial crash and clubs closed and fees dropped, I was in the shit. Uh, so the, since then, that's why I became a lecturer. And that's why I gave up drinking and gave up partying and concentrated on cheaper. my craft. It's cheaper yeah. when you put the uh, drinking because it's a lot cheaper. It's, it's, it's cheaper and it focuses the mind and you realise you don't need you don't need to get drunk. To learn party. From that. Listen to what he's saying. Exactly. exactly. Money in the bank. Don't drink it. So out. then uh, uh, the, the gigs 
I, I changed my whole attitude to DJing and the work started coming back in and and um I say the classical happened. And so luckily for me, because of the small part-time lecture salary and because um of the, the the past five years being so good, it's I've got money to to keep us going, you know, and my wife's got a, a full-time okay. job. That's but that but but that can't last forever. If it goes on another year, then I'll have to really consider doing something else. But you know, there are people who are not as fortunate as me. There's people who really haven't got that back up. They haven't got money in the bank. And and it's a real tragedy that there's no support for the, the, the live sector or the nighttime economy like there is for fishing and retail and airlines. I, I just think that's wrong. But then that's the nature of our government. They just don't give a hoot, to use an Americanism. They don't give a hoot. And don't pollute. <laughs> don't give a hoot, yeah. Um, and also, yeah, can I just say, I've just got to, you, got to say, it never gets mentioned, but so you mentioned about Hacienda Classical, and I mentioned the Manchester Camerata, Tim Crooks, and the MC Gospel Choir, and Peter Hook, and, and in the early days, Mike was involved. Um, but there's a guy called Fletch, and he's the Hacienda manager. I know Fletch. And I know Fletch. Without Fletch, listen, without Fletch. Where is Fletch? Would ne- Sorry, watch Fletch, where is well, Fletch? Well, he just sent me a message saying we should do something with Lenny. And I said, don't be so ridiculous. No, I didn't. I said, of course we should do something with Lenny. But um, without Fletch... No, but he puts on those big... He At the last one, I remember Fletch did that big party with all of you at the church or something, right? Yeah, that's he, that's right. Fletch... Yeah, I know everybody. The, Fletch, where are you, Fletch? Well, Fletch, the, ha, Hookie owns the name, but Fletch is is, is, is just so much behind the scenes. He's he the puts the events on. He books the DJs. Yeah. He makes the Hacienda Classical show yes. happen. He doesn't pay me enough, but that's another story that's from the time. I'm only, I'm only kidding. Well, like, no, 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 he, we'll have that conversation on the sideline. Don't worry about that. Listen, you know, you know, kidding. But he, listen, Fletch is amazing. He's, he's, a, he's a top, top guy, and he sometimes gets me up non the gigs. He's, he's amazing. He's fantastic. Quick so, question. you know, quick, quick, I owe my whole career. I owe my whole career to Fletch, even though he wasn't born when I no, I don't. I'm only making that up. But he's a top, he's is a top man. True? Is it true Frankie and Morales played Manchester before London? Yeah, they did. They did. And there was a bit of a hoo-ha at Hacienda when they played. Yeah, was Hacienda, involved. Right? yeah, yeah, they did. Frankie played a couple of times. Um, did you not see our New Year's Eve virtual Hacienda? Um, we did a live stream with a virtual Hacienda and a virtual Frankie. Yes, Martin. yes. It was it was incredible. Frankie. Right, here's another, here's another true story. They're all this is great because I'm remembering things I thought I'd forgotten. Frankie Knuckles at Hacienda, um, he was like had his he had a bottle of brandy on ice and a tall glass for it, right? And he goes, uh, like I said, look, Frankie, this is my DJ booth, but tonight it's yours. Anything you need, he goes, yeah, you know what? I'm really sorry, but my headphones, uh, the, I, 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 he either left them at the hotel or, and I said, do you want to borrow my headphones? And he borrowed my headphones. And you know what? I never used them again because they they I got them back and they just they, they smelled of Frankie's cologne, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> right? Frankie's cologne. And and I've never I never used them. I'll the probably in my lockup, I'll find them one day. And I and that and that's the only time I've ever left. Because it you know, most of the time it's like, hey, can I borrow your headphones? Sorry, I've got another gig. See you later. Um, because I always thought that you should, if you've got a guest DJ at your night, your club, you should look after them. That's a memo, and I might regret saying this, but that's a memo that aforementioned Junior Vasquez never got that memo when I played at Sound Factory. Um, it was at the New Music Seminar, and I was so thrilled. I'd been at the Sound Factory. I'd heard Junior Vasquez at the Sound Factory. The sound system, I couldn't believe it. And so I got to go there before they opened the club. No, I got to go there the, the night before and got shown the DJ booth upstairs. They had that back room little room in the back with the couches and the fridges and everything. And the DJ booth had four turntables, the crossover, the the rack with the amps and the EQ and everything. And the, the decks were beautifully balanced. And I thought, I, I can't believe I'm playing on this tomorrow night. So turn up the next night, two of the cartridges were not, were not there. So I had two decks. The crossover had a plate screwed over it. And the amp rack, the rack to the right, had a plate screwed over it. So I start DJing and people are going, hey, turn it up. It's not, I'm like, everything's on full blast. No. And I was furious. And I was finding like this guy said, you got to know what Junior didn't want it. doesn't want it this way. I don't give a fuck. If he came to the Hacienda, I, he could have whatever he wanted. If he wanted extra decks, or, 
on, and, and a bit. Come on, hold on. There's a reason why. There was an old New York thing with that shit. There's a reason why. You went to play the garage. Same thing Larry LeVan would do. They put the gates oh, really? on. Oh, yeah. Even the shelter with Timmy. I remember when Louie played the night with Timmy playing. The same night. It's his club. Louie's playing yeah. opening set. Louie's oh, rocking it. Rock. Yeah. Louis Vegas rocking it. I could tell the system's got like what I call like a cage on it. It's just not breathing. You, it's squat. yeah, yeah. Same yeah. Thing there. When Timmy got on T Rashford, wham! The system would just come a lot, and the crowd went crazy. And Larry Levine used to do same thing in the garage. That's why. I, I get that, but this was he wasn't you on that night. It was, it, was, it was me, but I made such a stink. I made such a fuss. What you do what Junior. Well, Junior turned up, and I was like, sat, like trying to be firm and, and, and but polite but angry at the same time and um he, he relented and he said yeah okay here's the car it is i'm gonna let us off but i'm gonna be here and, and and make sure you don't i'm like trust me trust me and then i almost blew it because i don't know if you remember in junior vasquez's dj box there was i can't be on telling you the story there was a huge brass penis I'm, right that just sat yeah and i put my baseball cap on <laughs> his brass penis right <laughs> And and he went, who, hey, who the fuck's put that hat? I went, oh my god, that's how. I don't know who's done that. Yeah, I'll get rid of it. And and luckily then, and then let me gave me the cartridges, and then I and then we got a great night. And that was the night that uh, Delight played um, at Sound Factory Bar. But I was furious. I was furious because I just thought I I, I get what you're you, saying. You no, know. no, no. You felt it was disrespectful. Why? I did feel disrespectful. Because he didn't know who he was no, dealing with. No, but you gotta understand. There's also a thing is it's their home, and I know how the I know how you guys are on your side of the world, and I know you're very complimentary and you want us to do a great job. But they were afraid. There's this thing about them having a control and having the feel of it. You know, it's their. I home. get. I, I get that. You know, what I'm saying it's an insecurity no. thing. It was an insecure. They were the gods. Gene Vasquez in those days was a god. Come on. No, I, I get it. Because in the early days of my career, I slipped my disc, but I couldn't, I didn't want to take the night off the garage in Nottingham because I was worried that whoever covered for me would do a better job. Of course, nowadays, I, I, you've got, you've got, at the end of the day, if you're a bit of a kind of camp queen that needs all this attention, you might feel that way. But if you're confident in yourself and confident in who you are, then you shouldn't worry about what anyone does. Concentrate on your own game. So, you know, when we had, we didn't have guests. When I, 88 to 92. You are. It happened to me. Hey? I played for certain, it happened to me. Happened to mm -hmm. T. Scott. Happened to many guys. They went to play at other people's clubs and they put the barbed wire on the system. You go there and go, yeah, Why I know. Why does it sound like a radio? The night before, it sounded like Goliath. Tonight, it sounds like little, 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 little kid system. Like, what I do. I do get it, but I think it is disrespectful. But but again, you you mentioned uh, Timmy Resford and Shelter. That that was an amazing club. But do you remember a club called Nels? Sure, I remember Nels. Basil, I, I yeah. Oh, I played there once. Incredible. I loved it because it, it was it was very red, wasn't it? Red and kind of velvet yes. everywhere. I loved. It. I thought it was amazing. It was a basement. You went downstairs, didn't no, you? No, everybody, you know, I, you know, Basil Hardhouse. Everybody, that was his club. He used to play there every Thursday. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, it was a great. It was it was, a, it was amazing times. I used to have friends who lived in on the Lower East Side. And I used to hang and stay in their apartment and wake up with cockroaches running across the <laughs> bedroom floor, and, and then or, or or you'd stay at the Paramount or you'd stay at Morgan's was my favorite Midtown hotel. I, I used to I I, I love those days. I love those days. Everyone cockroaches. Yeah, cockroach. But I, you know, maybe I should write a book. Can you yeah, maybe I should write a book. The room with no cockroaches, please. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm sorry. That one has mice. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Great. But that's New York <laughs> stories. And now, everyone, to wrap it up, Brooklyn is the new mecca where Manhattan used to be back in those days. So now Brooklyn yeah. is the spot now. And so God. up until the pandemic, it was. But we're getting back. Hopefully, we get back there soon. One of my one of my friend old friends from Manchester, Thomas uh, D. He lives in uh, Brooklyn, and I've I've still never been to see him there. You know, so oh, yes, not I, been to New York. Yeah, I, I saw him from time to time. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, not not but not been for a while. Last time I went to New York was actually with Fletch uh, that I mentioned earlier about five or six years ago, and we went and actually DJed 
in the Ghostbusters fire station, which is a good way of taking us back to the where I started the story. Oh, yeah. Stara. Holy yeah. shit. One, uh, this is the final question for the evening. Everyone wants to know. Aberdeen Football Club. What? Yeah, which <laughs> I don't know that you're a big footballer, but are you taking the vaccine when it's when it's ready to come out? I, I sure as hell am. Uh, I can't be doing with that anti-vax nonsense. Um, um, we all need to kind of knuckle down and follow the rules and we can all get back to partying. When you, when you read about people having illegal parties, come on, you're just delaying. You think you're being clever. You're delaying the start of getting back to normal. Um, because I'm in the 50-plus uh, bracket, um, I'm hoping to have my first vaccine by May, hopefully, but yeah, my, I mean, my mom and dad, they're in their 80s and they had their first vaccine recently. My, my, my wife's mom and dad. And I just think it's a terrific thing. I think science is amazing. And, you know, science and common sense and togetherness is going to beat this. So going off lies and misinformation on social media is not going to get us anywhere. And it makes me absolutely furious that I cannot do what I have been doing all my life and continue to earn money and, and share and give back the love and the joy to everyone because of a minority of people who are just, I'm not going to mention any lead singers of well-known Manchester indie rock bands. That would be the, this is the wrong place to do it. People talking absolute nonsense. I cannot wait to get my flu jab. And if I can, thinking about it, uh, if I can volunteer to help people get the flu jab, I think I will. Okay. It, and on that note, you've got to. You heard it. It's been it's been by our yes. senior lecturer, a senior lecturer of the College of House Music University, senior lecturer of Creative Media Technology at Glendale University in Lipper, and visiting professional at Lipper in Liverpool. But that's a little sideline. I am Graham Park, and I play music that I like, and people like what I play, and that's pretty much what it's, I want what to it's play about with this man so hurry up everybody let's crush this damn thing yeah let's go it's normal me and lenny need to put on a night together and, and we play will. we uh, are because imagine that combined knowledge of like a british terry dj an american Farley dj said to me terry farley said for god's sake i could see this true house stories going and having everybody wanting to play it again like play no, the no what he's no what he said was i can see this true house stories <laughs> getting really big in it mate all right Pie and mash. Deals. Deals. Jelly deals. And who's his team? Manchester. Terry Farley is, is a fantastic I love person. Terry. A fantastic he great. He's great. And he's got, he used to have this lovely curly hair that I was dead jealous of. Yeah, but he sounds like Winnie the Pooh when he talks to me. Hello, man. Oh, yeah. No, no, you're right, actually. He has, he's, he's got yeah, quite, got quite high, high pitch. He's more high pitched, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. All right, mate. How's it going? Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I've not seen him for a while. Yeah. This trash story, Lenny. This true ass stories, I think, are doing really well. Honestly, do you want some pie mash? Yes, pie Typical mash. Typical cockney food, yeah. Right. Jelly deals. Come on, then. Yeah. Faith oh, Fanzine. Oh. Have you seen Faith Fanzine? Party's got his top 20 in from the garage in Nottingham. It's fantastic. <laughs> Terry, if you're watching, I love you. I really do love you. <laughs> Listen, don't get me on impressions. I know. I just, but I'm still blown away about the uh, 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 Rock the Casbah. You singing all this. I'm like, beyond, 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 beyond. Hey, don't get me on my camp New York accent. That's really going to freak That's the shit out of you, okay? New York accent. <laughs> oh, so, get out of let here. Me, let, me, let me tell everybody and wrap this up. Remember, everybody, thank you again, Graham Park. You are the greatest of all time. Join TrueHouseStories.com. Hit the newsletter. Next week, we have Freddie Turner. He's going to tell you about Stop Playing With My Mind, Budokan, and all those great records he helped get involved and he's also he's he's also another singer producer dj it's unbelievable we have multi-talented people on true house stories and once again every week right here on the dial we do it one better than the other thank god grand park you are amazing <laughs> <laughs> listen hope to see you in the flesh soon if not this year maybe next year i will see so thank you, you. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching and listening to me talk nonsense. It's been great, and <laughs> hopefully I'll see you all nonsense. soon. Get back in there. Make more nonsense. <laughs> also, let us know about the new music coming out. We also want to be up to date. The remixes, please let us know and all that. And we want Mike Pickering. M I'm on it. 
please. I'm on it. I'm Have on a it. good week, mate. Take care. Good All night. Right. Thank you. Around the world. Love you. Yes. Love you. Bye.